And we are recording. So good, technically good afternoon, everyone. This is Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester uh, located at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. And today I'm actually seated at the Arnott Forest, which is one of our research forests. And we're joined uh, at this September Forest Connect webinar by two people that I admire very much who've done some really great work. And I've uh, I met them both through their Pennsylvania connections in the, and Pennsylvania does a lot of very cool forestry work. Um, uh, Sarah Wurzbacher uh, had been with Penn State Cooperative Extension and is now working with the Pennsylvania Game Commission as a silviculturalist. And I'll have them each give a more thorough uh, introduction. Um, I've known Sarah for a few years. Susan, I've known for much longer. When I first took the Silva training back in the 90s, uh, she was working as a team leader with a really productive research group out of the Forest Service in Northwestern Pennsylvania. And they've done some fabulous things over the years. So I'm, I'm really appreciative that they got together to talk about uh, a subject that I think deserves a lot of attention, which is how do we recognize and restore degraded stands? So I'll let Sarah, if you want to introduce yourself first, that would be great. And then Susan, and then you all can kick it off. Thanks, Peter. Uh, you covered it pretty well. Um, as Peter said, I, I work as a silviculture program specialist with the Pennsylvania Game Commission. I have statewide responsibilities our forestry staff work on about a million and a half acres across Pennsylvania. Uh, and the work that Susan and I are talking about involves collaboration between a large number of agencies as well as some private forestry folks, um, including the Game Commission that's been uh, a, a cooperative approach to, to some of these subcultural questions for many years. I'll let her fill in some more details. Okay. Um... I'm Susan Stout, and I worked for my entire forestry career as a research forester and later project leader for the U.S. Forest Service in Irvine, Pennsylvania, and may have met many of you over the years at Silva Training as I met Peter that way. Um, I'm retired now, but have remained involved, and um, Sarah and I both worked with the Allegheny Forest Health Collaborative Silviculture Working Group. And what we're reporting really isn't so much, it includes some research results, but it isn't so much research results as it is um, an adaptive approach that several people working with stands that had been degraded by a variety of different forces came up with as a way to respond to improving the probable future for such stands. And that's what we're gonna talk about this morning. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about who that was and how that worked later on in the talk this morning. So Sarah, if we're ready to go, we can go on to the slides. So I think probably everybody on the show knows that um, there are a whole variety of forces that can cause degradation in forests. Forest health is certainly one if you had a forest that had a lot of ash and emerald ash borer moved through your forest, then obviously the proportion of desirable seed producing trees in your forest was dramatically reduced depending on how much ash you had. And that was certainly a disturbance that you didn't plan. Um, a windstorm is another example of uh, an unplanned disturbance that can result in degrading a particular stand. And sometimes just time on very poor sites can lead to degradation. But one of the most common causes of the existence of degraded stands is management in the past that focused on extracted value versus long-term resilience. And I'd like to give um, two statistics from some work that Mark Ducey at the University of New Hampshire and some of his students have done. Um, they, they used FIA data to recognize stands that had had um, different kinds of silvicultural harvests, and there's a lot of detail in the paper, um, but they found, for example, that in New York, the data that they read, reviewed from New York showed that 
um, nearly 18% of the forests that had been harvested in the period they looked at had received some kind of a high grade, that is an extractive removal of the trees of highest value <clears throat> from the forest. And in another related paper, they identified that across Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont, nearly 40% of the forest land now has stocking of desirable trees below the 40% level that is unlikely to recover to a fully stocked stand of, with desirable trees within even a decade of just passive management. So this is a very broadly distributed and serious problem in the forests that all of us work with. <clears throat> Next slide, Sarah. Um, part, of the, part of the underlying problem is that with the high um, exchange of private land over time with land tenure, often less than a decade, a land owner can come into a forest and not recognize that it's degraded. And so there's been some interesting work. This slide talks about work that both Ralph Nyland and Wayne Clatterbuck have done um, that uh, describes the attributes. If you just walk into a stand, how can you recognize that you're dealing with a degraded condition? And not surprisingly, the patchy distribution of desirable trees, the relative absence of desirable trees, the unavailability of volume that would attract somebody to do work in your forest commercially, the absence of seed trees, that's almost synonymous with absence of desirable trees, almost, but not quite, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But what we haven't talked about up to this point is an equally important attribute of degraded stands as the desirable trees have been removed from the canopy by whatever natural or management forces, often because care for the understory condition was not part of the disturbance, interfering plants are the big winners of the new light and resources coming available in the understory layer. And that becomes a vicious cycle in a way precluding the development of a desirable seedling cohort to return the stand to the productivity that the site is capable of. Next slide. So here's another example of some very specific research that was done in Pennsylvania by Alex Kurtzey working with Dr. Laura Lides and they um, created a balanced set of mixed oak stands that had received a careful, thoughtful, sustainable forestry minded silvicultural seed cut and, and then an equal size set of stands in the same region, same forest type that they knew had had an exploitive cut in the past. And they said, so if we just walked into these stands as a new landowner, what would be the variables that would help us know which was which? And just as um, Nyland and Clatterbuck found, the proportions of oak, which in that case were the desirable species and the proportions of high quality trees were the most different variables between those two conditions. So if you, if you do walk as a new landowner, a new landholder into a degraded stand, there are tools that you can use to recognize that's where you are, but then, what do you do about it? Next slide, please. <clears throat> Before we go into what you do about it, we also wanna talk about in the case that you do walk into a stand that's in good shape, how can you prevent and or protect from the worst consequences of future degradation? So the protection thing is to always be thinking about seedlings and seed source. Be sure to give your seed source trees, ample growing space to produce seeds with an ever larger crown, and be sure to be watching your understory conditions. Watch the development of interfering layers like fern or beach brush or too much birch 
that can interfere with the establishment of seedling establishment and growth of seedlings of more desirable species. And similarly, if you're doing some kind of intermediate harvest, for, for whatever reason motivates you to do that, always be sure to work with your forester to ensure that the residual after that kind of harvest leaves a high proportion of the species and quality of trees that match best with your values and landowner objectives um, so that you are not the cause of degradation by management. And I think often when somebody knocks on your door and says your trees are ready for harvest, none of their conversation is gonna necessarily include what will the harvest I propose do for regeneration for the future forest? And that's always a question to ask and listen for stumbles or deflection in the answer of the person who's making that offer. Next slide, Sarah. So now, this has been implicit in what I've said, but I think that, um, or we think this isn't this is actually Sarah's work, but if you think about silviculture as a way to sustain the values of the forest in the future, then that silviculture occurs in the overlap between the potential of the existing stand and what your objectives and values for the future. Why are you holding this forest? In the case of a public owner, it may be to perpetuate a forest condition in a healthy form into the future in the place of a private landowner. It may be to create wildlife habitat or hunting or recreational opportunities, or it may be to create income in the near or far future, college money for a grandchild. But where those two overlap is where silviculture occurs. But next slide, in the condition that we're talking about, you find yourself with a forest whose current conditions limit the near-term options. Um, so you have a couple of choices. What we're gonna be talking about mostly today is practices that will allow you over time, next slide, to increase, whoops, I got them backwards, sorry. So you may have to stretch your values to meet your stand where it is. And certainly all of the data suggests that everybody who owns forest land expresses a stewardship objective. And so you may have to stretch your stewardship to meet a degraded stand where it is and find ways to improve that stand. So the next time, next slide, you can actually, in, you're, you'll find yourself with improved stand conditions that may overlap with your um, objectives and values for opening, for owning the land. So next slide, you're gonna find, regardless of whether we're in the stretching your values point of condition or improving stand potential, the nature of silviculture in degraded stands is that it must be adaptive. You're gonna to have to do the best that you can to improve conditions for seedlings, to make the most of what seed source you have, to grow those few desirable trees that you have to their best potential future. Take whatever intervention you identify as the best opportunity right now. Don't expect to solve all the problems at once. And then your next, your next step will be adaptive based on how the forest has responded. Next slide. So we're gonna talk about the urgency of, treated, of treatment needs later on, but the bottom line is you really have to think both about seed source and seed existing seedlings. And those are the two things that you really focus on in degraded stands. Can, do I have enough seedlings to go to a mixed age class stand? or to go to the next cohort right now? 
or do I have to optimize the little seed source that I have? And if something's threatening your seed source, then getting seedlings established right now is also a very high priority. Next slide. So you won't be surprised that the strategies might involve choosing, and these are really strategies based on how badly degraded your stand has been. If there are good trees there, they're just small, they're patchy, but you can create optimal conditions for those trees to become future seed source and future um, income. And then uh, if you really have little to no seed source left, then you really have to make the most of what you do have in terms of seedlings or even at some point planting in um, to regenerate the forest. And so let's talk first about rehabilitation. Next slide. In either case, you're gonna to have to conduct an inventory and that'll help you know where you are on this stand rehabilitation, stand regeneration continuum. But you're gonna measure the proportion and health and vitality and size of the trees that have some overlap with your objectives and values. And then you're gonna assess the barriers to growth of the trees, to establishment and growth of seedlings. And assuming that you're on the, <laughs> keep the current stand and work with it end of the continuum with your inventory, then your rehabilitation cut will simultaneously improve conditions to establish and grow seedlings and give the residual desirable trees a chance to grow and produce future seed. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah to talk about um, stand regeneration approaches. So really, um, when we think about these two strategies of approaching degraded stands, the question is really, where does the primary function lie and the promise of future function? In a rehabilitative <clears throat> approach, you're really like looking at what's currently there and trying to foster its continuation and health. But in some cases, we find that the overstory, like the majority of that um, population of trees that's there in that place is, it's kind of like past hope in a way. And really the, the best hope of recovering function in that stand, in that place, is to focus on establishing a very healthy new forest, a new cohort, focusing on the regeneration activity. So this is the majority of where the work that Susan and I have done in coordination with the Forest Health Collaborative, the thought processes that we've sort of run through have focused where in a way we've given up on the overstory and we're trying to capture function on that site by focusing on um, establishing and holding the site with good regeneration. So this is appropriate for stands that are where regeneration is possible. So they are mature or near mature and capable of producing seed source to foster regeneration on conditions that are conducive to that. And the goal of stand replacement approaches to degraded stands is to build resiliency in the system by um, rescuing that imminent loss of function and focusing on the future options. So regenerating a healthy new cohort now and or moving very quickly toward a regeneration sequence in a, a stand that's not quite mature enough uh, to try to get it to that regeneration phase as quickly as possible. So in an environment where this is what's being attempted, we start to think about like the minimum objectives of what we're gonna do there because this is a bit of a rescue mission and so we start with true definitions of minimums. This is where we are kind of expanding what we will accept from our hopes and goals and values and so forth. What we want is to make sure that a forest persists, a functional forest persists on the site. So we defined our, our minimums of what we might hope for in this scenario quite low. Maintain a forest condition, involve at least two acceptable overstory species. So we can't get as fancy with our hopes for diverse forests or 
really desirable uh, overstory species or a certain forest type and, and you know care and sort of fostering those conditions. We want to make sure we have a forest that's functional, that it's not a monoculture. And there are kind of three major factors that we consider in the types of approaches that we take to regenerating these stands. When I think about what regeneration is already present, so it's existing or it's there in advance, our advanced regeneration in the stand, um, what, what that resource looks like, how much there is, how we can treat it well and foster its, its growth, and what seed source still exists that's fairly healthy that could contribute additional regeneration to the site. And then any kind of problems, interference issues with, um, with other plants, non-native invasive species, things eating everything that you want, um, any other challenges. So throughout the slides, we're kind of represent each of these factors with a little, little symbol, uh, the seedling, the overstory tree, and the deer as representative of anything that's a problem, including uh, interfering plants. <clears throat> so as we think about each of these factors, and we think about the conditions that Susan talked about related to what degraded stands typically look like, it's useful to remember that the conditions that we face in these sites are often really patchy, really variable. So when we think about uh, assessing where we are to determine what strategy to take, keep in mind that doing some an inventory of average conditions, so seedlings per acre across the whole stand, for example, is often a, a less reliable approach to inventorying stands with less uniform conditions. And that's often true for degraded sites. So uh, we often want to instead kind of think of how much of the stand looks a certain way rather than how much of that thing is in the stand on average. I'll show you kind of a, a depiction of what I'm talking about. So if we're looking at how much regeneration is in a stand, it, if it's likely very patchy, the average seedlings per acre could kind of wash out the story of what's happening in the stand. If instead there were seedling plots uh, done and assessed, it showed that about half the plots that were assessed had regeneration stocking that was suitable, that was appropriate, that we liked. Um, we would consider that stand about 50% stocked with this attribute. If we did the same sort of approach and looked at how much of the stand sh uh, showed major interference problems, we might say we saw interference in 30% of the stand. This is a, a stocking type of approach, a plot stocking type approach to assessing these factors. And in degraded stands, when we think of these factors together, we think of how they interact. So the same stand, same two factors, but they overlap in different places. We might find that um, in 30% of the stocking involves interference, but actually uh, it overlaps with our regeneration heavy plots in certain ways such that only about 30% of our regeneration stocking is without interference. And in the other plots, it's, it's competing with interference. Um, and then we would have you know, a different envelope of what's free to grow in terms of regeneration that's, uh, that's up and out of, of the influence of these other factors. So the approach to kind of thinking about what you have can get complicated really fast. <laughs> things look weird, things look different. And often there are these kind of micro stand approaches and different stories playing out within one stand in degraded sites. So that's kind of a lot to put together. If I'm a landowner, do I need to go do this like complicated inventory system? No, I'm not gonna make you do that. But I'm gonna talk through this very texty slide to kind of thread the thoughts together. That it's important to know that when you're approaching work in a degraded stand, you're gonna find patchy conditions. The conditions are likely to look different, even in areas quite close to one another, there's a real lack of uniformity. And because conditions in these stands are often patchy, the treatments and approaches, approaches might look patchy as well. And they may not look very typical of what you might be educated to know forestry, good forestry is supposed to look like. But, you know, don't, uh, don't just sort of go with whatever is said, like think critically about what you know about what good forestry is. All of these, you know, Silvix is still Silvix, even in a degraded stand. Um, everything you know about sustainable practices still applies. You wanna keep the best of what you have, focus on how things are going to improve. Think always about leaving the stand better than you found it. You're focusing very much on that young forest 
to replace the older one. So we've considered these couple of success factors and we've thought really closely about how their position in space across the stand influences the approach that you take and what you can expect in terms of success. Uh, but there is kind of another layer to consider in terms of performance and silvics and behaviors of what species, what trees you find in those forests. So there's another big question that we wanna consider and Susan will talk through how we consider the concept of reliability uh, of species. So um, what I'm gonna use as examples are heavily biased regionally towards the Northwest corner of Pennsylvania and the Southwest corner of New York, which is the area in which the uh, Silviculture Working Group worked together. And really the reason for sharing them in this level of detail in this talk is to get you in conversation with your foresters about what's reliable in your area. So one of the real factors prompting the development of the Allegheny Forest Health Collaborative were big changes in the way black cherry is behaving in our region. And so where it was once a very reliable source of seed, it's become an unreliable source of seed. And so the ranking that we're showing here is not necessarily a ranking of how we value these species. I saw in the chat some interesting discussion about the ability of markets to meet what the forest is supplying. And I we can talk about that in the question Q&A, but black birch and red maple are certainly reliable, frequent seed producers under the right conditions. Quaking aspen will promote root sprouts. Tulip poplar is a very reliable seed producer. And one of the interesting things about tulip poplar is that its seeds can become established after the disturbance. They don't have to exist as advanced regeneration to be competitive. Oak species produce reliably, but with a long gap in, in time between prolific seed years. And then some of the species lower down on the list are really not reliable seed producers at all, at least in our region. But again, you're going to need to think about how this plot, this applies in your region and talk with foresters about that. And in, similarly to how we think about trees as producing seed source, we also have attitudes of, or, or observations about how reliable a seedling, once it's actually popped out of the ground, how, how dependable, reliable is it as likely to grow into a major component of the future forest. And that's the next slide. Oh, no, <laughs> sorry about this. Um, in addition to thinking about seed source reliability, I mentioned earlier, you may wanna expand your focus a little bit when you think about seed source, because from the perspective of seed source, in Eastern hardwoods, for the most part, trees that may be completely ugly from a timber perspective can still be producers of seed of, for trees that may themselves be beautiful in the future. So we think that a lot of what happens in terms of bad form has more to do with the specific growing conditions for a tree than with its genetics. And so you may wanna, if you're in this degraded stand condition, you may wanna expand the classes of trees you think about to include trees that you would otherwise call unacceptable they're the right species, but they have a poor growth form, but they could still produce seed source of desirable and healthy trees for the future. So that needs to influence your inventory is to keep track of those seed source unacceptable growing stock trees. And then, as I said, next slide, we want to look at the reliability of seedlings um, in terms of their aggressiveness 
growing in the understory and as you give them enough light to grow. So you'll see, for example, that tulip poplar and cucumber tree are very aggressive in the understory in our region. I think everybody knows that American beech root suckers are aggressive in the understory. Um, and so this list is slightly different than the tree list, but it's something else that you need to keep in mind in terms of how competitive seedlings are going to be. And when you know what your stocking is, you want to know both how much advanced regeneration is there and how reliable is it. On to the next, and then I think Karen Bennett was maybe just commenting that it's going to vary by region. So don't don't memorize this list, talk to the people who work near you and develop a list that works for your forest. Next slide. <coughs> and back to Sarah. So um, the, the approach to considering all of these different success factors and sort of try to synthesize them in particular prescriptive strategies for silviculture uh, has been a focus of the um, Allegheny Forest Health Collaborative's Silviculture Working Group. Um, so it's a group of, of silviculturists, uh, managers who have experience working in a region, have considered some of these questions of reliability of species, and have pooled their collective experience and thoughts and in this large list of people, which has included others and will include others again in the future. Um, it really um, represents a, a robust set of experience that kind of has crowdsourced some of these approaches of what makes sense, uh, what is possible in terms of economic landscape, in terms of the sil silvic silvical landscape, the behaviors of species and so forth. Um, and so the work that follows are, are some of the prescriptive strategies that have been well considered across ownership types um, by managers that hold different primary uh, focuses in their goals and objectives, um, leading to some of the sort of general tenets of what has been discussed between all of these managers, and then we'll get into some of the particular strategies. Overall, some of the things we kind of have in our back pocket of like always is and nevers as they relate to degraded stands are to never sacrifice a cohort of regeneration. When we have everything available to us in a healthy overstory, good species, good conditions. We, we can be patient. We can look at a cohort of regeneration, see that it's mixed in with some undesirable plants and sometimes go for like, you know, broadcast herbicide treatment, kind of reset things and try to get a better cohort. In the case of a degraded stand silviculture, when you have something that w promises to regenerate the stand and, and when you have acceptable uh, regenerated species, you want to hold them at, at, in every way possible. Um, and so there's never like a, a clearing of the slate moment where you, you, you might not hope for something better. So that's one, one thing we sort of would steer away from in degraded stands, which is different than what might be reached for in an, a non-degraded site. The second bullet is really the lower your standards bullet. So we talked about approaching minimums of our objectives. We want to keep a forest and we want it to have more than one species. That means we can't be quite as choosy with the species mixes that we look for in our regeneration assessments. We want to look for species that we deem acceptable, that perform as overstory species in healthy forest types that are appropriate to the region, not just the ones that we most desire for their commercial potential or mast production capabilities or whatnot. So we're looking to find more acceptable species, not just desirable species. Third, to lower the stocking of the needed factors um, as we think about trigger points for taking actions like overstory removals. So we can do more with less if we intensively care for that scarcer resource. We can proceed confidently with releasing regeneration, even if the stocking is a little bit lower than what we would like to have and what we tend to wait for in healthier sites because we have a little more urgency to our work. All of this kind of pulled together. We talked about the need to be adaptive, to more frequently evaluate the response, revisit the sites more quickly and kind of change the approaches depending on how the site is responding. 
and thinking very hard with your local knowledge about what you know works in that place, what you know certain species will do in those places. This is those reliability factors. The experience of the site matters a lot. This can be informed by literature, but really like the best teacher is the experience of, of what you know, like red maple tends to do in this place. Um, that That's really like you wanna rely on those gut instincts about the, what the way dynamics will play themselves out. So um, to kind of pull it together, we're gonna consider these success factors together. That's the context for management. So each of these prescription scenarios considers a different interaction of what the seedlings are doing, what the overstory is doing, and what the major problems are in the stand, the things that would be barriers to success. Overall, they, these strategies focusing on recognizing and capturing opportunities that are closing, and they involve kind of going one step at a time and trying to be adaptive. So we're going to kind of organize this based on uh, best case scenarios toward worst case scenarios. Um, in a degraded stand that is only slightly degraded, the seed source and regener uh, sea source conditions I'm gonna describe in one of three ways. I'll call it moderate, I'll call it limiting, or I'll call it poor. In a moderate seed source situation, you're not quite at the full stocking or function in your overstory of where you would like to be in a healthy stand, uh, but you're not too bad. In a limiting situation, it's you're starting to be quite concerned in a poor seed source situation, you have very few stems in the overstory that you hope will contribute seed to the site. So just think of these as kind of three major categories. In the first one, we're only in slightly degraded condition in the overstory. And if we have that in our overstory, and if we look down and we find that we have or have not regeneration, our approaches really are to do silviculture, do good silviculture that we know, but to be a little bit more ready with the gun, to, uh, with the trigger points of proceeding with harvests or moving through regeneration sequences to foster regeneration. And once we have adequate regeneration that is maybe a little bit less stocked than we would typically wait for before we go ahead with an overstory removal or before we go ahead with the next step in a shelterwood sequence, for example, um, we would be confident in proceeding with those steps even if we were looking at our regeneration assessments and we saw we only had 50% stocking where we would be more comfortable with 70% in a healthy stand. All of this is really has to consider that reliability factors where you have less reliable things and you approach those acceptable conditions, you proceed uh, with a little more urgency. In every one of these operations, you wanna be more careful that in any partial cuts leading up to an overstore removal, you would retain good seed source trees. Even if they're not acceptable growing stock, you know, perfect bowls and so forth, if they are lending seed that will be reliable, those should be held in partial cuts going uh, leading up to a final overstory removal and follow-up treatments should be planned. As I said, when you have less regeneration than you would like to have, you have to kind of baby it a little bit more. So but planning some follow-up treatments to kind of make sure that regeneration resource is successful is important here. So mostly this looks like what we do, but we're a little bit more careful uh, and we kind of are moving with a bit more urgency than typical. So let's think about another situation. Your seed source is, uh, is, is quite a lot worse than that last thing I described. If you have a limiting or poor seed source in your overstory, but when you look down, you find regeneration. And even if it's not as much as you would always want to have, um, there is enough to regenerate the site. The best thing to do is to just dump all of your investment and resources and focus into that regeneration that currently exists. With a limiting or poor overstory, there is not a lot of confidence or hope in contributing additional seed source or additional regeneration to that site. So the regeneration you have, you should sort of think about as like, maybe all you're gonna get. So there's an urgency to go ahead and do remove the overstory. If the overstory is preventing that regeneration from succeeding, or if you have a sparse overstory, reducing the overstory to the point that the regeneration can get up and out and be released. 
The worse the health of the overstory, the more urgently you really should act to release the understory and kind of reassign the resources to the regeneration. In these practices, work in the dormant season is preferred in case there is sort of more sprouting, more resprouting, less damage to the site. Um, and the same goes for retaining seed source trees, acceptable growing stock and seed source unacceptable growing stock as residuals, even as permanent residuals after the overstory removal. As it pertain pertains to interference, applying treatments as needed to release regeneration and make it free to grow are important, but these should be careful and selective, um, avoiding broadcast treatments that would risk harming your regeneration um, and trying to choose selective products that you can spray over regeneration without killing it, like oust for ferns, for example. Um, and a removal of, of low woody interference that is gonna shade out regeneration is essential as well in this prescription. So this is kind of the go for it, going out of business sale approach where you're really focusing on that existing regen resource. But let's say, um, oh, in this case, you would, you would end up with an even age stand if you did, went for the overstory removal or if you just did a reduction of overstory, you might end up with a two age stand if you would accept that condition. So let's think about the same sort of overstory condition. We're getting into a limiting seed source context, but we don't have enough regeneration to just go ahead and release it and remove the overstory. Um, something else is limiting regeneration on that site. Either there's too much in the overstory, the unhealthy overstory, there's interference that we that is occluding regeneration that's patchy, or there's interference everywhere. Um, and the approaches here kind of depend on what's the catch point, what's holding things up, and then the prescriptions work on alleviating that limiting issue. So let's consider the situation where the overstory, an unhealthy overstory with limited seed source, is the thing that's limiting regeneration. In this case, uh, we would proceed with a shelterwood seed cut. So uh, a lot of resemblance to shelterwood but the kind of focus on retention in that interim cut is to retain the best seed source that is likely to contribute to the site and foster regeneration before the final overstory removal, especially of seedlings of species that are reliable to, that would be able to establish in that period of time. I will note that this is a really difficult approach in oak systems. Oaks need a lot more time than in the typical like go ahead shelterwood sequence. Shelterwoods look different in oak systems um, that involve like a longer preparatory sequence. There really needs to be the establishment of seedlings in, in advance of those major shelterwood catch points here. Um, so this is more appropriate to see seeds that are able to sort of germinate and develop more quickly. So understand that if you're working in an oak system, taking this approach might kind of shift you away from that species. But again, we just wanna make sure that we have a forest there. If our, our overstory is being lost, we don't wanna lose the whole site. So in this case, where we're doing the shelterwood seed cut, it's really important to remove interference prior to that first shelterwood entry. So we wanna make sure that like the conditions that are out there are just as ready as they possibly could be for the contribution of seed, the germination of seed in that new light environment. So that prep work in advance of the first shelterwood entry is very important with the same kind of selectivity approaches that I talked about before. Again, work in the dormant season is preferred. And in this case, we wanna do really quick follow-up evaluations. We wanna see right away if there's an interference issue that's gonna cause problems for us. And as soon as we have enough regeneration to go ahead with the overstory removal, we wanna pull the trigger on it to make sure that we can capture the opportunity. We don't want seedlings to kind of show up and languish and then fail and all the while risk the loss of more seed source. In the case where the thing that's really holding things up in the understory is interference that's patchy, we take a patchy approach to management and we look at little spots where we have regeneration and it's free to grow it's not being interfered with by other plants. And we might concentrate overstory removal gaps around those places. And then in other places where we find interference, we might prepare those gaps by removing interference um, and hoping for regeneration establishment there. All the while retaining seed source to try to get more germination in those prepared patches. 
and kind of taking this little micro stand approach throughout the stand. Um, if you do this once or two, uh, on two entries and then you find that like things look pretty good everywhere, you can kind of go ahead and re remove the rest of the overstory or you can just do patch by patch kind of approaches over time. So depending on what that looks like and how many times you're revisiting the site, you might end up, you're very likely to end up with a multi-aged condition and move toward uneven age management in a site like this. But in other cases where the thing holding holding you up is interference that is just a wall. Um, this is common with, with advanced uh, beach brush. This is common with uh, non-native invasive species that are woody species. Um, this is maybe the one situation where you kind of need to clear the slate. And I said, never sacrifice a cohort of regen. But in this case, when you're facing this situation, you probably don't have very much regen anyway. Um, in stands like this, typically with beach, an approach that has worked in some cases has been to do mechanized removals, like chipping, of that interference layer. Um, so this is a way that maybe you can actually get the work done, uh, break even, or even partially commercially, depending on local markets and what's available to you. Um, but all the while trying to protect and not ding up or damage any of your seed source trees. This is one where like, depending on what's in your overstory and the stocking, like you might need to couple it with another treatment to kind of change the light environment a little bit. So this is not a standalone treatment to regenerate the site, but it's a preparatory treatment that will get you to the next decision point about what to do next. So for solid interference, doing a mechanized removal like this uh, can be really useful. In the very worst situations, where you have very little seed source and very little regeneration, you're in a tough spot. Um, the, in some of these cases, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of talk about how your decisions might be different if you are a landowner with many stands to manage versus a landowner that this is your forest and you wanna do something in it. You would maybe treat your decisions in that place a little bit differently. Where you have many places that you could work in one of the things that we've discussed is that actually like your, the investment of your work might be better served in a stand that's that's less in need of help. It's the opposite of what would happen in a, an emergency room triage. The sickest patient, maybe in this case for, for degraded stand management, just doesn't get treatment. And you treat the ones that you're able to salvage function a little bit more easily. Um, but if this is a, a stand that's of essential importance to you, it has salvage value that would be imminently lost. It's it's your backwoods that you want to sort of maintain function in. It has a place in a, a context for wildlife habitat in a landscape context that's really essential to kind of preserve some structure or function in, in that place. That's something that um, the Game Commission considers really closely. Um, and your ability to kind of have success in those places. What's the deer impact like? Could you buddy it up with another sale that's happening nearby and actually realize some opportunity to work with a little bit uh, less direct investment? Those are things that might tip you towards action in a place like this. But you're always considering the return on investment for any activity. If you decide to go for it in a place like this, you want to think about being very opportunistic about any regeneration you can find to release it. Never sacrifice any seed source trees of acceptable species at all in any treatment. So whatever small resource you have that would be helpful to the site that's functional, keep it if you, if you are able to. This is where doing artificial regeneration, supplementary plantings might be viable or appropriate as long as you can protect it from being eaten by deer or from being um, overgrown by interfering plants. And you really kind of want to approach these sites quite intensively to always be kind of releasing and fostering, releasing and fostering to try to recover those sites. So it's challenging, but it's not impossible, especially if you are well motivated. And in some of these cases, because you're probably getting quite patchy, you would accept a possible multi-age multi condition for the forest in future. So I want us to kind of do a little bit of an exercise. Um, all of these prescription scenarios have been couched in what's happening in the overstory and what's happening in the understory. So I want to kind of think about an exercise of where we would think about those concepts of reliability 
and push our ourselves toward a different prescription um, where the prescription that's dictated by the simple inventory of things might not tell the full story. If this is kind of where we are, we're okay in our seed source, but starting to look a little rough and we have regeneration, um, we, we might actually, but, but let's say most of that seed source stocking is in oak that has been quite stressed in recent years. Um, we know that you know some of these prescriptions don't work as well in oak systems and stressed oak trees are less likely to produce larger acorn crops. We might actually sort of demote the value of that seed source or consider the seed source to be more limiting than moderate in that situation. Let's think of another situation where we have limiting seed source and lucky us, we have adequate regeneration. But when we look closely at that regeneration, we see that it has some pathogen issues. It's mostly black cherry and it's got leaf spot. And we know after talking to our forester that uh, black cherry seedlings with leaf spot tend not to survive past a couple of years. You might see a cohort sort of bloom and die quickly. So in that case, we might demote our rating of the regeneration story in that place to an inadequate condition, even though there's a lot of seedlings present. We don't rely on them. So in another situation where we're in the same spot, we have kind of suspect overstory and not very much regeneration, um, but we see that a lot of the nearby seed source stocking, though it is limiting, is in a highly reliable species that is likely to contribute a lot of seed. We might, uh, yellow poplar in this case, we might actually promote our opinion of whether that seed source is limiting or moderate, uh, bump it up to a moderate condition and rely on it a little bit more because we know that that seed is, is likely to be contributed well on that site. That's kind of how you would sort of move yourself around in this decision matrix, depending on the reliability of species. So once again, like kind of wrapping all of this up, what all these prescriptions have in common are really avoiding any harm to regeneration that you have, widening your standards toward acceptable species, not just the best or desirable species that you have in your assessments. Um, working with what you've got intensively can be better, can still work even if you have less of it. You wanna kind of be very frequently evaluating responses, going back a lot, and trusting your knowledge of the system of what's reliable in those places. And Peter, that's all we've got. <laughs> okay, well, that's great. Thank you. Um, so this is uh, delightful. I've had, I have three notepads going with notes that I'm taking about a variety of different things. Uh, and there's been a lot of activity in the chat window, which is always fun. So this is uh, an opportunity for participants to be typing in questions. Please make sure that you submit them to everyone so that everyone can see the questions. Um, also, just for those of you that are interested in continuing egg credits, you've already done what you need to do. When you registered for the webinar, you were walked through a registration form and you had to select, um, uh, you had to select uh, an option for continuing egg credits. So I'm gonna lead off uh, with the first question, everyone else, please this, and we'll go back, Susan and Sarah will go back through and we'll we'll work through the questions. We probably won't review. There's kind of the commentary that was that was embedded, but the questions will pull those up. So in a couple of places, you talked about uh, recommended a dormant season overstory removal or overstory treatment. I'm assuming that so you're in, going to reduce the damage to the seedlings that are established. How does a dormant season harvest compare to using equipment maybe that's not going to be quite as disruptive? I'm thinking like a forwarder. And this is our scenario. And this is like, this is a real life thing. We've got a 25 acre oak shelter wood that has really good oak regeneration. We've started to pick up some mortality with defoliations and frosts. And so we're moving towards an overstory removal. And we were thinking about a forwarder, but I'm not sure if we need to be thinking about dormant season as a harvest restriction. So what are 
how does Susan and Sarah think about that? And you're both currently muted, so you have to unmute. I'm going to defer to Sarah. I know that we were thinking about stump sprouts, pr promoting stump sprouts as part of the new cohort. Oh, okay. Yeah, that that was the primary thing behind the the dormant season, but the the question of damage is also relevant there. So I think there's so much variability in terms of what equipment is is being reached for in different places and what you know what's available to different contracts. So, but the same principles apply. So, Peter, it sounds like you're you're already thinking about that on the site that you're that you are. I think contract restrictions only make sense where they really get you something. So, right. if there's a, a a known need to retain very limited overstory seed source and you're very concerned about damage to those, like then that's where like a contract restriction might make a little bit more sense. But contract restrictions for their own sake are are get in the way of, of work sometimes. I agree, I agree. Okay, good, glad I asked that question. Okay, so Sarah and Susan, can you, how do you wanna handle the the chat Q&A? Do you want me to read the questions or do you want to read them or what's what's gonna be easiest for you? I think it'd be helpful for, for you to pitch questions to us, Peter. I wanted to add just one more thought to the last question that um, like there might be some cases where we're, species mixes indicate that the little bit of some ground scarification that happens in a harvest might actually be advantageous to germination conditions. So again, like some of those machinery considerations should be based on what's in the stand and what's what the response is likely to be. So that's kind of where you get put your e ecologist hat on as a forester and think about what happens there. Sometimes a little bit of soil disturbance is a good thing. Correct, okay. Good. Um, so, so, go, go ahead. ahead. No. I, I want to be sure to pick up on Chris Zimmerman's question about defining desirable species when considering multiple values and what goals or future outcomes were we thinking about as, as we develop these adaptive approaches. And so, I, I think desirable species do vary depending on the values of the landowner or land manager. And I don't think anything that we're suggesting here differs depending on the on what the landowner's definition of desirability is. The point is that often stands that are degraded are faced with scarce seed source for a desirable species. Um, and then in terms of multiple goals, I would say that forest resilience and health were certainly the driver for what we were considering. But I think these principles apply whether your primary objective is wildlife habitat or timber, that, that both of those in a stewardship context, the sustainable forestry context, you can't really achieve either of those things for the long run without considering forest resilience and health. And then I want to confess that honestly, we have not considered the carbon stock issue in particular, but I do have a colleague, Chaley Hoover, who has said that understocked stands are one of the biggest opportunities for improving carbon storage in eastern forests. And if we think of the statistics that I presented at the beginning of the talk about how perhaps as many as 40% of stands in northern New England are understocked with desirable species, then maybe those two things marry together, maybe they don't, depending on what's filling in above the um, desirable uh, the desirable trees. So I don't know if that's helpful, Chris, but that's my thinking. And then somebody else to ask about microsite variation. And certainly in a lot of ways, what we're talking about here really matches extremely well with um, variable site conditions because we're talking about silviculture in general becoming 
patchier as you try to address degraded stand conditions. So to the extent that you know what's going on in terms of microsite in your stand, then that marries very well with a more patchy approach to silviculture. Some of the degraded stand approaches are actually opportunities for some creative approaches to managing structure. So it's not, it's never desired to be in a situation where you're dealing with a degraded stand, but where having some of that heterogeneity on the landscape and some sort of more patchy or variable opportunities that you're realizing if you have the ability to manage it with a little bit more intensity, um, and this is certainly true of, of habitat management for wildlife. That's that's something that's actually pretty cool to work in as a system. So some of those micro site opportunities are better realized in approaches like this when we're sort of forced into them. There were a couple of questions uh, about midway through the presentation that were wondering about enrichment planting. Uh, Susan commented on the need to that was an option after removing interference. Are there other considerations and and in your uh, in your what to do section towards the end? You you brought up enrichment planting uh, as a tool when you're lacking seed source and lacking advanced regeneration. So are there considerations for deciding on when to use enrichment planting and then how to execute that effectively? It's always available um, as long as it, it, it is intensive. It requires protection of seedlings until they are off to the races. And, um, and as Susan indicated, preparing the, uh, an environment for them to succeed in by removing interference, by protecting them from being eaten, et cetera, are all pretty central um, to, to those approaches. Some of what is in these prescriptions that we've we've talked through are kind of the the most sort of operationally friendly approaches with a focus on natural regeneration with the idea that it is intensive and difficult and expensive to do rehabilitative work in degraded stands. So what would be sort of the, the friendliest operational approach to those things that would utilize um, natural regeneration? I, I noticed there was another question I wanna tie in related to, oh, if I see a good seed source tree, like a black cherry, should I collect seed for planting? Um, part of what, what our approaches focus on is just recognize <laughs> that and protect that tree or retain it through different operations so that it contributes seed directly on site for you. So like let your seed source trees work for you. Supplementary plantings are, are possible when they're necessary, certainly and can be reached for even where they're unnecessary to enhance success. But we tried to focus on like what the minimum intervention would be that where you could hope for some success. Anything you would do that would be more intensive or, or add to the success by maybe planting a species that would be underrepresented in the stand or something like that uh, would, would certainly be helpful uh, if you are willing to pay for it and have the capability to tend it. Would you add anything to that, Susan? No, I think that's well covered. There were um, a few references that uh, for, for one of the participants, um, they perceived a, um, a tendency to avoid multi-age stands. Do you want to talk about the disadvantages of multi-age stands or in what circumstances you might accept a multi-age stand? Multi-age stands uh, tend to require more attention in terms of their ret return intervals. You have sort of different cohorts and different stages of successional development. In a situation where uh, a focus would be on reliable or known capacity for timber production or even known capacity for acres of a certain successional condition, it may be less desirable in a planning system like that, where even aged approaches give us a clearer picture of what's available on the landscape um, and what the sort of operational requirements to tend those places are. 
but where the ability to manage with a little bit more attention or intensity exists, multi-age stands can be really interesting from a structural perspective, from a resiliency perspective, in terms of, you know, should, should some disturbance appear, there, there are multiple age cohorts with the ability to occupy space in a, in a place like that. So one is not better than the other. It really relates back to the primary objectives of the landowner and what would be desired in that place. Okay. Um, another question uh, notes that the these practices tend to focus on increasing sunlight and allocating sunlight to desirable species to grow them faster. Um, and the, particularly the growth of timber species or acceptable species, which may or may not always be timber species. But from an ecosystem point of view, is it always preferred to try to accelerate growth or are there other kinds of, of outcomes that are important? I, I want to hear Susan's answer to this, but I want to just start start with the thought that um, in the in degraded stands, the, the starting place is always, there is some threat to function in that place. Um, part of the urgency to regenerate is the recognition that the existing system functioning now is at risk of not functioning because it's dying, because it's declining, because there is some disturbance issue that's that's present in that system. So recovering function by establishing a new forest that will grow over time, that will function for a long time is, is what's being reached for. That's why this sort of urgent focus on regeneration is focused on in the prescriptions that we discussed. But in healthy systems, where there are many more options, there are so many other avenues and opportunities for long rotations and unusual silvicultural regimes um, that, that are available. So from my perspective, if I was looking at a big landscape of a lot of options, I would reach for those other things in places that are healthier and able to, to support that work over a long time. And in these degraded sites, the focus is really on returning function to, to a healthy system. So not surprisingly, I agree with Sarah. And I think if I'm if I'm seeing the question that you were referring to, Peter, I, I think it's not necessarily correct to say that we're always talking about releasing as a as a generalization, um, and certainly, if if you have evidence in a particular place that a higher light level is likely to favor um, invasion by a plant species that you know is already in the neighborhood, and you have seed source for trees that are um, compatible with growing in partial shade, then you should favor the partial shade. But in these situations where um, the species that are desirable from the perspective of your values and your reasons for ownership are not, um, are waning or nearly absent, then focusing on the needs of seedlings of those species to the extent you have or can get them should be one of the driving principles for making civil cultural decisions. I, I enjoyed both those responses, perfect. And I just, I'm remembering that slide you showed early on that said that this all needs to be adaptive. And so right. that's like that's like the one word response and, and you, all, uh, you all expanded on that. Um, Chris wants to know, uh, he just says thoughts on high deer herbivory as a major limiting factor. And then also a second question relates to the fact that you listed black birch as reliable in terms of a seed source, if I remember correctly, in terms of a seed source and, and seedling establishment and growth. But what's its potential for desirability, the desirability of black birch? So question one on deer herbivory, question two on black birch. So 
Hi, dear herbivory, especially if, if you only have access to a relatively small property on the landscape. I think about it all the time. I have lots of thoughts about it. And and Sarah, I think, did a really thorough job in this particular slides of saying that you, if that's an issue where you're managing, you absolutely have to address it. And if you don't have the choice of reducing deer impact by dispersing high, high forage producing um, patches on your landscape, then you're really going to have to put up a fence on either the stand level or the individual seedling level. Um, and you can do that with woven wire or as Peter and his colleagues have shown, you can do it with high slash fences around the outside of your harvest area. But you, you absolutely have to address it. And in terms of black birch, that's a species that's greatly increased in abundance in our region. And we think that, and we treat it as acceptable. So often in Sarah's presentations, when she was talking about expanding our standards to include stocking with acceptable species, it is black birch that that's acceptable species that's being added into the mix to evaluate for um, a future cohort and for current stocking. And then I'm going to refer back to very, very early in the chat. Somebody talked about the fact that um, markets seem to find a way to meet whatever we're producing. And although I think there's good evidence to support the fact that that's true, I, I personally am really, really worried about the narrowing of species composition in our forests through the combination of insect and disease factors and deer herbivory. And to the extent that we can extend beyond that two species, to the extent that we can keep species diversity on these sites, both by expanding our range of what we accept and by nurturing um, the species that seem to have the most difficulty surviving I think those are essential elements of good stewardship. Birch is like the classic example that we bring up when we talk about this, like lower your standards concept. Birch is a, black birch is a native species. It grows and sequesters carbon. It's capable of being re regenerated reliably and potentially run on a short rotation where something else could be reached for in the next opportunity um, to appear, for example. So, uh, you know, sometimes in, in places where the most difficult conditions exist, where seed source is greatly reduced and your options are lower, um, holding the birch maintains a forest, maintains a mycorrhizal environment that would be appropriate for something else down the line. So, um, in, the, in the most difficult places, having something that is reliable and known is not the worst thing in the world. My, my anecdotal observation on black birch is that it, it seems that, and this is some of this is historic and I, it may have diminished in recent years, but that uh, in, the, in the Eastern part of kind of mid Atlantic, New England, New York, the Eastern areas, black birch had maybe better markets or better favorability. And as you moved westward towards Ohio, let's say, and I, I'm not picking on Ohio, but just as a point of reference, as you moved into those Western areas, there was um, a, a less warm reception for black birch. Um, I, I know here at the Arnott Forest, there was, this is one example in the last 23 years. So take that for what it's worth. But we had a black birch tree that sold as veneer, which just surprised me. Um, so we're thinking more and more about like how to grow quality black birch um, because as I think Sarah just pointed out, it's easy to regenerate and it grows fast. So, okay, let's look back at some other questions. I want to respond to Paul Knoll's poignant remark about after 50 years of battling beach brush, we certainly don't want to lose it. Um, and the most optimistic thing 
that I can report there is that the Allegheny National Forest has had um, some significant success. And I'm talking about beech bark disease now. I'll get to beech leaf disease in a minute with identifying trees that appear to be resilient for beech bark disease and not only um, conserving them at the time of final harvest as residuals, but leaving a circle around those trees if um, herbicide is used to protect the genetically uh, related uh, root suckers in hopes that they too will be resilient to beech bark disease. And in terms of beech leaf disease, we don't know yet, and we actually have a stand on the experimental forest where we did that save trees that appear to be resilient to beech bark disease in a stand that we were harvesting just as beech leaf disease moved in. And so we will watch around those saved beech trees to see if the regeneration that comes up around them is resilient to beech leaf disease in a place where it's known. But I, I share your um, concern. One more note on beech leaf disease. Uh, there's, there's so much unknown with that, the dynamics of that, as Susan has indicated. One thing that will happen in a heavy to beach forest that is beset by beach leaf disease and has enough years to develop symptoms drastically is a, a process not mediated by managers or landowners wherein a large change to the light environment will occur with the loss of, of the leaves of that layer. Um, and so even if it's not like you're, you're not planning on doing some operation at a certain time, those those stands will require your attention to watch what happens to them to understand whether there's something that might push you towards action in those places or at least just to see what happens what develops in those places it's an unplanned large scale thing that that may just appear over a region um to which i don't really have an answer of what to do other than it warrants us to pay attention to those places heavy to beach um, and be adaptive in those places. And Andrea asks if their consideration of forest keystone species play into the approach that you've described. I don't know if Andrea is still on, we may be able to get a clarification of that if there are questions or if you're not sure how to interpret it. I mean, well, it's, it seems to me it does because you're, you're targeting the species. So you're targeting the species and working with the species that you have to available. And because of that, they become keystone species that you leverage to perform uh, in the direction that you want to take the stand. But it may also involve accepting a change of forest type if you are losing, for whatever reason, seed source of what was a keystone species. So what what Andrea's question triggered in me is that in his recent work, Pat Brose has defined keystone species for several different forest types and the newest versions of Silva really play on that keystone um, species concept. But this, this particular idea of working in degraded stands certainly involves accepting the notion that whatever caused the degradation may cause you to change to a different forest type with different keystone species. But you have, um, you, you also talk about preserving seed sources. And so you right. may, while there may be a, a shift in the characterization of forest type uh, or stand type, that you that could include elements of some of the 
original or previous and maybe desirable keystone species that you uh, keep in the event that they can contribute to future regeneration, forest regeneration? I think the approaches really emphasize that where desirable or keystone species are able to be fostered and retained, they certainly should be with, with even more um, energy emphasis in degraded sites, but where they cannot be held, cannot be fostered because of extremely challenging conditions. The key thing is not to lose hope or heart for those sites and to recover function where it's available, even if outside of those species. Okay. On that note, we can close out the noon hour webinar. Thank you both. This was a fabulous presentation and a really fun discussion. So I, I appreciate you all. I appreciate the 157 people that uh, participated uh, when we hit the maximum. So. Susan and Sarah will be back tonight at seven. If you want to come back and see the same presentation, uh, it's never identical. And you'll all, you always learn something the second time that you hear something. So you're all welcome back. Certainly Susan and Sarah are welcome back and I look forward to that. So thank you all. Have a great afternoon. Thanks.